welcome to Mose Cyber Security Institute's YouTube channel. My name is Benjamin Mose and I'm the founder of the Institute. Today I'd like to talk about a very emotional topic in the industry, which is the topic of hacking back and more generally speaking, active defense. Now, um, a lot of people who engage in this topic take a very sort of moral, ethical, legal stance and they just say that, you know, hacking back or active defense in general uh, is probably illegal, uh, we shouldn't poke the bear and that, you know, if we do anything to engage the adversary then there's basically a risk that, uh, you know, the tensions and the hostilities are going to escalate. Um, I'm going to really share with you two stories that I think really contradicts this because uh, we've done some work in that field, although I'll be very upfront, we've never done a full-on hacking back operation, but I'm going to share with you an actual real engagement that we've done for a customer where we went you know, very, very close to actually making a call to hacking back the adversary. And, and I want to share with you how we arrived to that decision which was really, you know, we were just the security analysts uh, doing the work, really. But I want to share with you why the people that were the decision makers and the leaders at the client actually really had to entertain this idea and go, you know, really close to pulling the trigger on this. First and foremost, um, what I want to say is that, generally speaking, all the board members, business executives that I meet, you know, on a weekly basis, None of them think that hacking back is a good idea. None of them really want ever to be placed in a situation where they have to engage the adversaries in any way. However, some of them have been put into really uh, unfortunate, impossible situations. Uh, and one of those situations that I'd like to share with you was when uh, it was in 2017, we had one of our customers that uh, received an email from uh, an adversary that used basically a bogus uh, Gmail account that was created. And they sent basically four, five people in the organization one gig worth of corporate data uploaded on Dropbox. And they said, you know what, we actually have uh, 300 gig worth of data that we've pulled out of your network. Uh, we've been in your environment for about two years. If you don't pay us, uh, you know, seven figures, I'm not even going to reveal the exact number, but if you don't pay us seven figures, we're going to publish this data online, and we're going to sell it on the dark market, and your company basically is going to suffer uh, damage to its reputation, you're all going to be fired, and you have 48 hours uh, to make a payment to us, uh, and they want it to be paid uh, into a bank account. Uh, okay, overseas. Now, here's what happened. Imagine that you're in this scenario, okay? You're now downloading the zip file that they've included, <clears throat> and you see that all the documents in there are internal documents. They're not public documents. They can't be found on the internet. So you're pretty certain that at this point, the adversary has actually indeed uh, entered the environment and stolen this data. And you have 48 hours to figure out whether uh, you know, you're going to be victim of a blackmail, okay? And they're going to literally try and uh, destroy the reputation of your senior leadership and your executives, or do you pay the blackmail fee, okay? That's the situation. What we did, we were called in, and obviously we did some network forensics and some endpoint forensics, and we never really discovered anything conclusive, or at least at the very start, nothing conclusive about really how the attackers had entered into the network. Uh, the files that they had uh, shared were all from a shared drive and multiple employees had access to this shared drive. So it was very difficult to pin down, you know, which employee had been compromised. And so what we did is that we started employing negotiation tactics. And uh, the first things that we did is we basically tried to delay uh, the, the payment deadline. So we ask questions like, you know, how can we pay you a million dollars overnight? Like, it's not that easy to just find the money and just wire the funds. Okay, if we pay you, how can we be sure that, uh, you know, you're not going to go ahead anyway and 
publish the data or sell it on the dark market? How can we get any guarantees that you're not going to try and hack us anymore? And so uh, long and behold, what ended up happening is that we ended up on the phone with these adversaries because they were pretty confident that uh, they had us, that we were going to pay, and they just had to jump through our hoops of questions until the, the customer would just basically accept to pay the, the blackmail fee. Now, what ended up happening is that as we were exchanging emails and phone calls with them, uh, we believed that they were based in Ukraine, they were holes in their stories. We basically figured out that just the way they were describing uh, what they had, uh, what the environment looked like, how they'd gotten in, and, and we were going back and looking at forensic traces, things were just not adding up. And eventually, <clears throat> in the end, we called them on their bluff because after about five weeks of just back and forth with them, there was really nothing proving in any way that they had stolen as much data as they did. And it was a very big call, but we simply had all the data and the facts backing this call. And so what ended up happening is the, the client didn't pay. We eventually did find the employee that had uh, their mission compromised. They had a, a reverse shell that had been installed and then removed, but there were still forensics artifacts uh, left over behind that we could identify. And really, the attacker had just gone onto a single file share, downloaded about five gig of data, which was bad, but you know there was no PII in it. There was nothing really too significant in it. And so the client could basically just uh, decide not to pay and uh, in the end, nothing happened. The attacker didn't go ahead with their threat because they didn't have the data. And so this is, I guess, a case that really um, any kind of traditional security advice that you can get from the industry would never have been able to handle this. Like this was not a matter of going out and deploying two-factor authentication across the network or anything like that. We really needed to put out more intel and delay the payment deadline to be able to resolve this case. Uh, and it's actually one of the cases that I'm the most proud of to have delivered in my career. So um, just another example, a positive story to show you that you know, active defense is not only something that can escalate tension with the adversary. If anything, in some cases, it can be the only solution to resolving a major crisis. Now, secondly, the second story I want to share with you, and this is the one where we almost went to, to hacking back, but we didn't, is uh, that uh, we had a, a client call us to uh, you know, respond to a major incident. Unfortunately, we were called uh, three weeks too late. So we found out the implants, we found out the reverse shell, we found out the C2 infrastructure, and um, it was clear that the attacker had indeed stolen intellectual property from the organization, and they had left in their malware credentials uh, for us to interact with the C2. And guess what? The C2 had a, a feature to list all the files uh, in the backend web server. So we listed all the files, and unfortunately what we discovered is that the files that uh, the attacker could have downloaded from the client's network had already been moved elsewhere. So when we browsed the, the file uh, share using the credentials that we had and their vulnerable PHP backend, essentially there was nothing left behind. But what I want to point out here is that let's say that we had been able to respond quickly enough. Hopefully within four hours of the adversaries getting in and stealing the files, we could have got our hands on the malware, figure out how to list uh, the files on their servers, then the PHP backend had a delete feature. All right. And what I want to say is that, honestly, at that moment, I think that the right call would have been to delete the files in their backend and then block their IP and their domain name. All right. Now, it is very controversial to say that you're going to go on somebody else's server and delete files, but they're your files. You know that it's an attacker infrastructure. Um, you know that they've stolen these files. Honestly, I could not make a case for saying that if we had an opportunity to stop them even after the files had left the environment, we shouldn't have done it. Now, let me just say that it is, you know, active defense and what I like to call adversary management and the offensive countermeasures. They're not, I think, what I would advise as being your number one security strategy. 
the industry has very well established very good preventative measures that you should put in place to defend your network. But there will be circumstances where you'll be placed into, you know, what I call impossible situations where traditional cybersecurity strategies and tactics are not going to work and you have to really be solution driven and you have to have a lot of empathy for the organizations that have been compromised. Sure, you know, you can criticize them in hindsight and say that, you know, if they had done this or that, the breach wouldn't have happened. But really, um, you know, I find that, you know, taking just the moral high ground really doesn't acknowledge why the topic of hacking back and active defense keeps coming back up. And really, that's the question. Why is this topic coming back up again and again and again? And it is coming back up, in my opinion, because traditional cyber security advice doesn't always work and when it doesn't work we have to look towards unconventional tactics and strategies that yes you know they probably operate within the gray area of cyber security but you know what uh, if you have a choice between paying you know a seven figure seven dollar figure blackmail fee or paying nothing because you decided to negotiate with the adversary that's better than just whinging about 2FA not having been deployed across the environment and another thing that I'd like to say is that probably the worst argument I've ever heard against uh, you know active defense is that you know if you ever hack back or engage the adversary you may generate a global cyber war of some kind you know I don't think that's true at all um, so Again, I hope that this video has brought you insights in the matter that maybe you look at this topic under a different light. Um, really, what I would hope the industry can achieve is to actually come up with solutions outside of the conventional methods of how we do cyber defense to say, hey, you know what, if you're taking ransom and you're a hospital, maybe it is okay to pay the ransom. If you're taking blackmail, and you know maybe it is okay to negotiate with the adversaries maybe if they've stolen IP or PII from your network and you have an opportunity to delete these files before the adversary makes a copy of them maybe it is okay under some circumstances to do it we really need to open the conversation and not just deny the topic completely because otherwise the topic is going to come up again and again and most likely the wrong solutions and the wrong advice will be implemented in the end. So thank you for watching. It's a pleasure to have you on our channel. Hit the subscribe button, hit the bell button, and we'll see you soon on our channel.